I want to remind you again that uh, at the, after all of our speakers have given their presentation, you will have a chance to uh, engage in some questions and answers with them. So um, just hang tight, because I know you have lots of questions by now. Our next speaker is Stephanie Freiberg. Dr. Freiberg is a member of the Tulalip tribes of Washington State. She is the William and Ruth Gerberding University Professor of Psychology and American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. As a social and cultural psychologist, Dr. Freiberg's research explores the ways in which the social world systematically influences how people understand themselves and their actions and ultimately how they shape important life outcomes such as education attainment, attainment and health. Her presentation, Reclaiming Native Truths, How the Psychology of Omission Fuels a Cycle of Bias Against Native Americans. Dr. Freiberg's presentation will take a critical look at how K through 12 social studies state mandated content standards include or erase indigenous people and native nations from the telling of US history and civics as well as highlight how some states and organizations are working to address these curricular problems. Let's welcome to the podium, Dr. Freiberg. Good afternoon. Let me start by saying that's not what I will be speaking about. Um, that's what Sarah just spoke about. Um, and so I don't want to mislead you uh, right from the get-go. So I'm actually going to talk more about invisibility and the ways in which in education, when we use a narrative that's not accurate or when we don't talk about Native children, there are ramifications. And I'm going to talk about some of the ramifications for how people now think about Native people and whether or not people support issues that are pertinent to the long-term survival and well-being of Native communities and people. So in doing this, I want to start by touching on the narratives that exist, but I also want to then connect to a story. So Native people and Native representations loom large in America's collective imagination. So we're very popular in sports venues uh, around Columbus Day and Thanksgiving. Cowboys and Indian um, kids love to play cowboys and Indians. There's a long history around the use of Native people in Westerns, um, white shamanism, and there, there are, Native kids are impacted by this. So these are actually some images that I took from my daughter's kindergarten classroom. And as a parent, um, you know, she's my oldest, and when she was in kindergarten, I received an email from the parent um, classroom helper, and it was asking us to donate so that they could make the objects on the bottom there. And the explanation we were given is that it was in celebration of Columbus Day. So, you know, not wanting to be that parent, um, <laughs> I put together a, a letter. And, you know, I, I'm going to admit that I'm pretty sure it came off with a little bit more vinegar than honey. But I tried to give the teacher the benefit of the doubt, and I said, you know, maybe the goal is to say that we once thought this, but now we know this. Maybe the goal is to acknowledge um, the, you know, the, the different narratives that we have in American society. Um, anyway, I sent her a bunch of books. I sent her some articles she could look at. But at the end of the day, my real issue was that my daughter, who's native, for her to sit in a classroom that teaches a romanticized version of Columbus Day and that doesn't, that doesn't teach the atrocities that Columbus engaged in, creates a narrative that, you know, we live on the reservation. And there are people in our community who are homeless, who struggle with addiction. And when we drive down the main road of the reservation, 
If my child only knows that romanticized view of history, then she can only think there is something wrong with our people. But when she knows the truth, when she knows that terrible things happen to our people and that we have had much to overcome, then she can see both in the people who stand on the side of the road and in the life that we lead, having a mother who's a professor, um, that our people have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And those shaped realities are a direct result of what she learns about who we are in school. Now, granted, my child has the advantage of a mother who has a PhD and who, you know, actually took the opportunity to, her teacher was not very receptive. Um, the email I received said something akin to, and by the way, there will be a chapter about this in my forthcoming book, um, <laughs> with copies of the emails. Um, but she effectively said, no names will be attached, let's be clear. Um, but she effectively said, Stephanie, we care about all children. Right? Um, and, you know, I have to say that at that point, um, I, I was very disappointed. And I was disappointed in part because I felt that she couldn't understand what this really meant for me as the mother of a Native child. But I also felt frustrated because the other students in my child's class also need to know this story. And so when we think about why representations matter and why the work that you as educators do, it's very much tied to representation and whether or not we provide a narrative that helps us to engage other groups than our, than our own in ways that are true, fair, and just. And so I want to start by saying not only do we know that these representations have ramifications, in my own research team has examined the effect of various representations like Pocahontas, the mascot issue, a variety of negative stereotypes on Native students, um, mostly middle school and high school students. And what we find across all studies is that compared to being exposed to nothing, these representations lower self-esteem, they lower kids' sense of community worth, which is in essence a sense that their community has the power and resources to enhance itself. Um, it lowers their achievement-related aspirations or goals. And I want you to just notice here, let me see if this, uh, Right here, this is the control condition. Well, when you look at the negative stereotypes, negative stereotypes lowered self-esteem, but when you look at these pictorial representations, they actually lowered self-esteem more than negative stereotypes. And I think it really speaks to the idea that an image carries more than just the image itself. And so I often hear people say, you know, don't Native people have more important things to deal with than the mascot or, you know, Elizabeth Warren claiming to be Native or Megyn Kelly's reference to blackface, redface? You know, we do, but we don't. Because when you look at all of the research that's out there across health, well-being, um, various indicators of psychological and socioeconomic well-being, identity is tied to all of them. And so when you play with our identities, when you use them and demean them, it has implications, which is the reason that so many Native groups have taken it upon themselves to stand up to educators, college, K-12, and ask that we remove these images from learning environments. It's important that our children have the opportunity to be successful and that that come with not having to overcome the ways in which people play with our identities. And so when we look across these representations in a variety of domains, we see, for example, that in the media, little to no media representations portray Native Americans as contemporary people. So, whether, so these are done in various years, but the most we see is four-tenths of one percent of contemporary representations. And so this, keep in mind, we, if we include Native people who identify as Native American and something else, we make up over four percent of American society. And so this vanishing, in, vanishing Indian rhetoric 
leads people to think that it's much less. But in fact, there are great stories from Native actors and actresses of them not being given jobs on popular television shows because, quote, Americans won't buy a Native American as a doctor or a lawyer. And so again, it's the story of being written out of contemporary life. If we look at Google and Bing searches, our team looked at um, the first 100 Google um, and Bing images that came up. So it looks something like this, and it's what comes up when you put Native American or American Indian into the Google site. And what we found is that 95% of the first 100 Google images and 99% on Bing are antiquated portraits. And in fact, many of them are Edward Curtis images, which if you know the history of Edward Curtis, he traveled around. He's probably the most famous photographer, although I would hope that by the end today you will think Matika Wilbur should be the most famous. Um, but he went around to tribal communities and he photographed them, but he asked them to dress in the way he wanted them to be seen. And so Edward Curtis was basically creating imagery of his view of what Native Americans should look like, not what Ma Native Americans actually looked like. And so there are cases where he has Plains Indians dressed as Southwest Indians and coastal Indians dressed as you know, Plains Indians. And the whole thing is very interesting. And of course, the imagery is beautiful. And he does, you know, we, we won't, it's not a question of his photography ability, but, it is important when we recognize that he is the most famous. I mean, it's his imagery that comes up everywhere. Uh, school curriculum, um, which there was a great presentation on. I thought about taking it off, but actually we normally present on it, and it's exciting. I actually got to meet Sarah for the first time today. Um, but I love this because it really speaks to how important it is for us to really consider the context. And then in social science research, of the approximately nearly 40,000 peer-reviewed publications on prejudice, intergroup relations, stigma, and stereotyping, only a half a percent of publications mention Native Americans, right? So these are largely produced by Native American social scientists. Um, only two-tenths of one percent include Native American participants. And let me point out that the majority of this research is not studying the group. So a lot of the research with African Americans doesn't study African Americans. It actually uses African Americans in the imagery and vignettes, and it asks non-blacks to rate the, some variable, right? And it sees what kind of prejudice or discrimination it elicits from people. And so it turns out there's no reason we can't use images of Native Americans. It's really that social scientists just don't. Even in stereotyping and prejudice research, there's an omission of Native people. There's literally an actively writing us out of the contemporary story. And the research I want to show you today shows that this has consequences for Native people. So why do they matter? The omission of natives from public life and from these discussions influences what native people see as possible for themselves and what others see as possible for them. Um, I, you, I could go on for hours of the many stories that native students who've, who've come up and talked to me about what their teachers thought was possible for them, or even in my own experiences of being a straight A student and having teachers accuse me of lying, that I couldn't have been that good because we didn't have native students who were that good. Representations influence literally how long we look at each other, the distance we keep from one another, the likelihood that we are to give each other the benefit of the doubt. These issues have serious ramifications for everyday life. What we know is that most students of color, when they leave education, they leave not so much because they feel like they can't make it there, they leave because all these subtle cues have pushed them out. They've told them that they don't belong in this space. And much of our work focuses on how do we redefine cultural spaces to be spaces where diverse groups of students, both in culturally diverse and socioeconomically diverse students, can have a space where they belong 
and can be successful in that environment. People use the available representations and what knowledge they have about Native people to determine how to think about the group. And finally, people make judgments and act on their representations and stereotypes of Native people. And so I'm going to focus on two key points. So the way I thought about this is, what do I want you to walk away with? Okay, so there's really two key takeaways. One is invisibility is the modern form of bias against Native Americans. And I'm going to show you data about how Americans lack knowledge about and interaction with Native Americans and tribal communities. And that these omissions shape people's ideologies about Native people's experiences and their attitudes towards Native people and tribal communities. Second, I want to talk about what it means to combat invisibility to leverage change. And that when I talk about using messages to shape perceptions, these are messages that I hope you as educators will take home with you and really recognize the importance of as you think to reshape the curriculum that you do use or as you develop new curriculum to really think about the power behind the message that you use. So starting off with lacking knowledge. So we did two large national studies. The first study was with uh, st college students from 12 different universities. We have about 5,000 students. I emailed a bunch of my colleagues around the country and said there's a tremendous lack of knowledge about bias against Native people. Would you help us? Everyone said yes. So in this, what's interesting, the other one is a group of adults. But in, if you start by looking here, we got together and we came up with the 10 most common historical and contemporary ideas that you might know about Native people. So on average, among our 5,000 college students, let's keep in mind that these are students who got into top universities in this country. They could, on average, answer 12% they got 12% correct for historical and about 24% correct for contemporary. Now, these were multiple choice questions, but if you're a statistics person, they could literally randomly pick and do as well as they actually did. So if we look at the other side, so for the national sample, we actually made the test easier so we gave the same questions, but made them true or false. So let's keep in mind now, you have a 50-50% chance just by guessing, and people did worse than chance. So when it came to historical, people knew, got just over 40% correct, and when it came to contemporary, about 30% correct. So this is the knowledge people walk away with, right? These are adults who are functioning, there are 9,000 people represented in these two studies. Now, why this is important, right? Of course, having knowledge matters, but let me show you how else it matters. So, hold on to that point. It also is the case that the majority of people have never met a Native person across both samples. So, if you look, these are the percent who say they've never had a native, close Native friend. They don't have Native family members. They don't have any Native acquaintances. No Natives know them by name, right? And across all who say no in all of these, almost 40% say no in all. You look at the adult sample, it's very similar. But now, right, our representation, in your mind you should be thinking, it's because Natives live on reservations. I mean, how would we have contact? less than 40% of Native Americans in the U.S. actually live on reservations. The rest live in cities, in communities, in towns. They're at universities. They're lawyers and doctors and professionals. So this is really important, and here's how I'll start to show you why. Okay, so 71.7% .7 of people rarely or never encounter or seek out information about Native Americans. And part of what happens is we simply don't come to mind. Now, when we then say how does this shape people's thinking, well, accurate knowledge about Native Americans, so how much knowledge you get correct, predicts the, the, your likelihood of 
acknowledging that Native Americans face racism and discrimination, and your belief that the world is unfair. Knowledge of famous contemporary Native people, not historical people. That the number of contemporary Native people that individuals could cite was related to the same thing, the acknowledgement that Native Americans face racism and discrimination and belief that the world is unfair. Now, this matters because we take this even further and we show that your belief that Natives face racism is tied to how warm you feel towards Native Americans and how much you humanize them. So if you look over here at the bottom, when we believe that Natives do not face racism, and keep in mind, we're largely omitted from discussions of racism and discrimination in this country. Well, when I don't know that Native people face racism, I feel less warm towards them, and I humanize them less. So, and when you look at these rates, it's literally like seeing Natives as being about 62% human. And so the rates are higher if we know that they face racism. So in essence, what we're seeing is that when we know Native people face racism, we feel warmer towards them, we humanize them more, and we then look at whether these variables relate to people's support for issues that affect Native people's everyday life. Protecting sovereignty rights, anti-mascot, acknowledging accurate information about Native people. So we had a question about should U.S. school systems teach students about the genocide experienced by Native Americans? So it was more accurate information. There's a variety of items in each of these. And then material and equity concerns, right? So reduce poverty, these types. Well, it turns out that when we believe that Natives, when we know that Native people face racism, not only do we feel warmer, but right here, Natives face racism, we have greater support for policies that support the well-being of Native people. We're more likely to support tribal sovereignty, um, which, by the way, is what allows us to be nations within nations. Right? Sovereignty isn't just sovereignty, as President Bush says. Sovereignty is literally the things that allows us to be tribes in this country, that maintains our separation of our communities, our ways of life from mainstream society. So we have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. We are a nation nested within a larger nation. And so our well-being, right, because we are nested now within this country, our well-being depends on our neighbors. So how people think about us, what the national narrative is, literally impacts everyday life for our people. So similarly, belief that the world is fair. When we believe that the world is fair, right, what we see is that we, are, we see less warmth towards Native people. There's no connection to humanizing Native people. Similarly, however, belief that the world is fair is related to support for Right? So when we think the world is fair, we don't feel a lot of support for Native people. When we acknowledge that the world is unfair, we see greater support for all of these issues. Okay, so what about combating invisibility to leverage change? So what we did is we started out, and I'm only going to talk about three of the messages that we used, but we provided information, including statistics, to support each of the messages information about disparities, which really was, in essence, our control condition because it's one of the things that people knew a lot about. But then we wanted to change it, right? So then we have information about systemic oppression. Now, what's interesting about systemic oppression is that, in essence, systemic oppression takes responsibility away from individuals and locates it in individuals. But this is important for you to know, because what we know in the stereotyping and prejudice literature is that when we make people feel threat, when we make people feel bad about themselves, they stop learning, and they find it harder to have empathy, right? Because now I need to protect myself as opposed to attending to this other group. And so as you think about how you teach about these groups, it's really important to think about how you present the material. 
So systemic oppression. And then we had the, a really interesting response to contemporary success. And contemporary success was really giving evidence that tribes and native people have leveraged success in this. So they're making change. They're actively working to change our lives. We're contributing to contemporary life. And so what we find is, first of all, as a manipulation check, we look to see whether people, so we had about, I think we had close to 4,000 participants in this study. It was just under 4,000. If I had the computer in front of me, which it's over there, um, I could tell you the exact number. Um, but by and large, people believed each set of information that they received. Now. We then look, and I'll walk you through this, so we compare messages. So in this case, this is systemic oppression compared to disparities. And so what you see is that systemic oppression messages increased belief and is associated positively with the belief that natives face racism, more than disparities, okay? And then when we increase the likelihood that natives face racism, we increase support for all of these. People feel warmer towards natives, they humanize natives more, uh, they, give, um, they endorse support for teaching accurate history, reducing inequality, protecting sovereignty, banning native mascots and logos. So this systemic oppression is much better than teaching about disparities. And in fact, we've gone on to study disparities in a variety of, of um, studies. Teaching about disparities makes non-natives feel threat. And so we have to be very careful about how we teach about this because again, people, when all people across groups, across SES, social class, religion, when we feel threat, we stop being learners. And because we want students to be learners, we have to be very careful how we teach this information about these groups. Similarly, um, it also increases the belief that the world is unfair. Um, and so it's the exact same relationship, um, but it's very good to know that we can increase people's belief that the world is unfair. And you might think, do we want people? We do want people to know that. I mean, it's essentially the world is unfair. There's great disparity in this country. Um, and so it's good for people to know that there's variation on this. It's a good measure. But more importantly, across the research, believing that the world is unfair makes people more sympathetic to people who have difficult lives. When we look at contemporary success versus disparities, what we see is that it doesn't change beliefs that natives face racism. And this is actually not surprising because here we're, we're leveraging change. We're not focused on disparities. We're really focused on the ways in which tribes and native people across this country have improved themselves. And, and so we don't see that, but we see the same relationship hold for belief that the world is unfair. Now, in the first set, the, these conditions predict, but in the case of belief that the world is unfair and contemporary success, the relationship does not work to go straight from contemporary success to these. It only influences people's support through belief that the world is unfair. So it, it's, it's basically a mediational analysis, not so important. The important take home point for all of you is that when we teach people about contem contemporary success, we are changing their ideologies about the world being fair or not fair, and when we change that, we increase support for Native people and Native. Okay, so what messages appear effective? So highlighting systemic oppression positively in influences perceptions of Native experiences and support for various issues related to tribal communities. The caveat, this may be particularly threatening to conservative whites. And we say that only because they tend to fit into the category who, don't, who believe that the world is fair. Um, and so, right, it's again about what threatens people and we want to be very careful because for me, I want to influence all people. And so as you as teachers, where you work, where you live, who your families are, very much should you need to think about them as you couch the information that you're teaching. 
Focusing on contemporary success positively influences perceptions of Native people and support for various issues related to tribal communities, but it does not shift perceptions that Natives face discrimination. Also interesting, um, just as a side note, this condition is where we received the biggest backlash. So there were people who wrote us um, really terrible, horrible messages at the end of the study. Um, and they, those messages were about Native people being horrible people. And so there was something, again, about how contemporary success was actually threatening to some individuals. We're trying to understand that more. The goal of this work is to really understand intergroup relations and to be able to help build a bridge and close the gap between what people think and how, what they've been taught in the past and what is a more true or accurate view of these groups. Okay, we also examine the effect of messages on historic information and current census demographics, and those messages yield no positive effects. By the way, which is interesting when we think about the fact that the majority of information we provide kids in school is historic. I mean, it's, it, it's good to keep that in mind. Okay, other things from our research, and here I just, as I conclude, I wanna tap into a few other ideas um, for educators. So first of all, um, I just mentioned that learning about social disparities Native people face is damaging. Um, it literally decreases warmth towards and increases dehumanization of Native people. So it's really important to put those disparities in context to help people understand what led to those disparities. Um, if you focus on some of the systemic issues, policies, laws that influence, so you could think about relocation, you could think about the Dawes Act, how those influenced how tribal communities function, and then sort of walk it forward. The boarding school, how it's influenced engagement with education. It's easier for people to take learning about disparities through the lens of systemic oppression. Also, messaging is not just about perceptions of natives, it's also about perceptions of whites. So through this, we have been studying how whites' views of themselves influence how they see native people. So invisibility of contemporary natives makes whites feel more warmth towards their own group, it increases white self-esteem, and increases humanizing of whites. In turn, these effects lead to decreased support for tribal issues, uh, which ultimately harms Native peoples and tribal communities. Um, representations of Natives are deeply tied to whites' national identity. Higher national identity is associated with less support for Native issues and holidays. Um, in two sets of studies, we're actually looking at Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and so, just as a one-liner, so people who are high in American national identity do not support Indigenous Peoples Day, and they're more supportive of keeping Columbus Day. But when people are lower in American identity, um, so they feel less affinity towards that as an important part of who they are, right? Keep in mind, this is not saying I'm not American. It's how central that identity is to how I think about myself. So when I have a lower American identity, then what matters is what my stereotypes are of natives. If I hold a lot of negative stereotypes, I don't support Indigenous Peoples Day. If I don't have negative stereotypes about the groups, I do support Indigenous Peoples Day. And so here you can see warmth towards white Americans is associated, negatively associated with all of these policies that would benefit Native people. So the warmer I feel if I happen to be a white American, the warmer I feel towards my group, the more I humanize my group, the less support I have for these pieces. And it's really important to keep in mind, our identities are connected, right? Because our histories are connected. We don't really have a choice. We can deny that history. But the reality is that Native people and white settlers in this country have existed together for a long time. 
And so to the extent that the romanticized narrative allows me as a, if I happen to be a white person, to feel better about my group, I have some need to hold on to that. And it's similar in the mascot debate. We see that whites, for example, have higher self-esteem when exposed to the Indian mascot. They like other white people who wear Indian mascot regalia. And there are no social consequences for whites when they engage in these behaviors. That's really important, right? It's important to know that we're caught up in systems and that there are very different outcomes connected to these representations. One, it means something to be the target versus the observer of these representations. And so I want to conclude with some key takeaways. The modern form of bias against Native Americans is the omission of contemporary ideas and representations that reflect the ways in which na Native people contribute to society. Social change requires infusing the broader cultural context with more accurate contemporary ideas and representations. We did a study where we went into an elementary school and we coded every image that was on the walls of teachers' classrooms. And it turned out that the number of positive and contemporary representations was correlated with, it was related to, how much the native elementary school kids in that school thought their teachers liked them and wanted them to be successful. Native people in communities are leveraging this change, but the omission is that many people do not see, choose not to see what is right in front of them. Native individuals in com communities must impose who we are and force the world to deal with us, not with its idea of us. And I just want to end by showing you a few images from Matika Wilbur. Uh, Matika is um, Swin Swinomish and Tulalip. Um, so I, I know the Tulalip because we're shared. It, she's from my tribe too. Um, but what I love about Matika's work is it really is about taking the idea of contemporary representation and showing people that not only are we here today, but we're doing today the way we want to do it. And so she's showing us as both a reflection of an engagement with contemporary societies, but how we have chosen to be Native people in contemporary society. And so, importantly, tribes leveraging change. 93% of federal and state recognized tribes have tribal justice systems. That requires legal codes. I mean, they're extremely complex systems, and it's important for people to recognize that as tribes do this work, there, it requires a very high level of, of how their communities are organized and put together. The Indian Child Welfare Act passage gave license to tribal nations uh, to build foster care systems that best meet the needs of tribal communities. And it's really important for people to know that every tribe has their own system. So as there has been a backlash against ICWA, ICWA only applies to children off the reservation. Every tribe in this country has its own tribal tribal um, child welfare system. And I know this because I wrote my tribes. And in ours, we were very careful to consider best interest of child, um, with the psychological well-being of the child. Psychology is deeply embedded in our system. And we can give our children something that the state welfare system can't do. We can teach our children how they are connected, who they are connected to, and who they are as cultural beings, which is something that often children who are adopted out don't know and across groups feel a tremendous sense of loss. Um, violence Against Women Act gave tribes the legal ability to charge non-natives for committing violence against Native women and children. If you don't know, the rates are up to seven in 10 Native women experience physical and sexual abuse in their lifetime. 80% at the hands of non-natives. So without the ability to protect women and children, right, it essentially means predators can come to our communities and cause harm, and the federal government does not have the resources to take on the majority of those cases. So they, those victims do not get justice. Uh, numerous tribes have developed their own school systems, including the revitalization of tribal languages and customs. So I just want to end by showing you some contemporary 
and historical representations of Native American scientists, Native American political figures, and what I hope will be future Native American scientists. <laughs> These would be my children. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freiberg.